Welcome to the Nantucket Whaling Museum. My name is Michael Harrison. I'm the Chief Curator and Obed Macy Research Chair. And I am delighted to welcome you for a conversation about art and about Nantucket and about representations of women in the art of two very important American artists during the 1870s. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with Kathy Foster from Philadelphia and Ann Knudsen from, where should we say you're from? From here, Nantucket. Um, I'm gonna let them each say uh, a couple words about themselves in just a second, but I wanna set up the conversation tonight by saying that uh, the three of us have been involved for the last three days in a meeting of art scholars and curators uh, talking about issues for a future exhibition that we're planning uh, in partnership with the High Museum of Art in Atlanta uh, that looks at Eastman Johnson and Winslow Homer, um, and we wanted to tackle some of the interpretive issues uh, around what we want the exhibition to do, see if the concept that Anne and her, her colleague at the High have come up with really stands the test uh, and scrutiny from colleagues, um, and sort of look at, look at pictures by these artists and see if the, the sort of emerging checklist for the show stands up and are things that we were forgetting. So we've been talking art for three days, and we really wanted to bring some of that excitement and scholarship and enthusiasm to the public and in, in a certain sense let you know sort of how the sausage is made with exhibition making. Um, so bef bef before we get a couple of comments uh, from my fellow panelists, I just wanna ask everybody in the audience here, uh, is anybody here never heard of Eastman Johnson or Winslow Homer? Or would they admit it? Or would they admit it? That's a great. <laughs> And of course, I, I would be surprised if any of you had come um, with no knowledge whatsoever. But one of the issues that we want to tackle, um, in, in, or that one should tackle in doing any art show, is not to assume that people already know the complete biography and importance of the artist that you're presenting. Uh, you know, and particularly if you want to like shed new light on their work, you, you need to peop bring people along to where you yourself are beginning that conversation. Um, so we've been wrestling with some of the issues around that as well, the familiarity of these artists and sort of the standard um, received wisdom about what, what's normally thought their careers, what we think their careers are and, and, and the ways they look at things and take that a, a step further. So anyway, I'm gonna sit down and I would like, Kathy, tell us, a, you have an extraordinarily long title at your institution <laughs> that I think represents a lot of accomplishment, but tell us just briefly what you do in Philadelphia. Well. Let's, let's yell into this thing. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, I have been at the Philadelphia Museum of Art for 20 years now. Um, before that, I was at Indiana University, and before that, I was at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and I have taught at various institutions along the way as well. At the current moment, my title is the Robert L. McNeil Jr. Senior Curator of American Art, and the director of the Center for American Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So he's right. It takes a long time to get through that. Um, but the, the gist of all of that um, curator stuff is uh, my own expertise is really in 19th and early 20th century American painting. I've written a lot about Thomas Aikens. I've written a lot about watercolors. Anne and I worked together on a show on Andrew Wyeth. Um, so American realism is a thing that I know a lot about, and American watercolors. And I was invited to this um, convening really as Team Homer, because I've worked on exhibitions about Winslow Homer um, and Winslow Homer's watercolors. Um, so that's kind of what I would bring to the conversation here. I was asked to bring something surprising to my introduction, and so that maybe people don't know. And so I would say that my, uh, my mother uh, and my grandparents had a house on the cliff and my mother came to Nantucket every summer in her childhood in the 20s and 30s. And when she was engaged to be married to a young medical student at Columbia University, uh, the two of them, maybe after their marriage, came to Nantucket and my father sold tourist watercolors from a studio on South Beach. So, I have like a Nantucket thing, I do. <laughs> I have those watercolors of Main Street um, in my house. So that's, that's, my, that's my story. Okay. 
and that was sure burn turnpike where your parents were that's right all right so ann tell us okay i don't like doing this so much that's so okay. right now we, I'm a consulting curator with the NHA, and I've been working on exhibitions with them for the last three years and loving it. Before that, my last, I'm an independent heart historian and curator. So the last show I did was World War I in American Art, if anybody saw it, it traveled around. And before that, I worked with my beloved Kathy on Memory and Magic with Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Andrew Wyeth. Before that, way before that, I knew Kathy when I was a lowly curatorial assistant at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Do you remember me there? You kind of intimidated me. <laughs> but you were so good at what you did. Let's stop there and let's get on with it. No, that, that's great. Um, so Anne, you are the originator of the kernel of truth that we're hoping to, to elucidate with this upcoming exhibition. And I'm hoping that you'll tell us a little bit about sort of where the idea from the exhibition germinated and sort of where it's, where it's developed to um, that led to our conversations this week with the other scholars. Yeah, that gallery opened in 2019. And in December 2018, James, if you remember James, asked me if I would get involved with the NHA. And I've been coming here for 30 years, mother-in-law, husband, and never did anything with the NHA. And I'm an American art historian. That's kind of embarrassing, right? Anyway, so he said, and I thought, wow, this might be a fun opportunity. And he said, can you come up with an idea for an exhibition to open that um, gallery? So the growing American art collection in the NHA pretty jazzed me up, and I thought, me and the generosity of private collectors on islands. So I thought, can I find a way to take images from the collection, pair them with interesting images from private collections, and tell new stories about all the artwork? So this up here, I've got to turn it on. I've got to put my glasses on. Uh, one of the pairings that really jazzed me up was Nathan Manter and um, Eastman Johnson's Peddler. And you only see one side of that there. And, I, and I've never done any work on Eastman Johnson. And the girl in that painting was... So I put those two together. We own Nathan Manter on the left. And that was the model for the peddler, Eastman Johnson's painting, on the right. And it was fun to bring them together, probably for the first time. But what really got me about that painting was the woman in the peddler. She's self-contained, self-absorbed, really completely involved in what she's looking at, which are pins that the peddler's selling her but there's something really different about her than traditional images of, oh, women. And I thought, you know, there have been lots of little exhibitions here on Eastman Johnson and images of the old sea captains, but he was also painting strong, self-sufficient images of women. So I started to put together a list and came across this one, which is in a private collection and we need to find, but this is one of the first images of a young woman reading a newspaper, and it was done on Nantucket. And I thought, wow, smart woman, reading woman, absorbed, and what's so neat about her is she's completely unaware of the viewer and completely absorbed in what she's reading. Um, I, that's new. And can I throw in that one of the things that we talked about over the last few days is that in decades previous to this, you might have representations of women reading, but they're holding a Bible. They're, they're reading things that talk about their status. There you go. That's a great... Their, their status as, as moral upholders in the family. Go ahead. And they're presenting themselves in the book. They're not absorbed in it. They're not thinking. They're not psychologically charged at all. So this is a big change. And Eastman Johnson is doing it in space. You know, in, yeah. I also found, I, and then I started to put it in the context of Nantucket. And if any of you all have not heard Mike speak about the history of strong, capable women with their own businesses as leaders on Nantucket, you need to, because it's really good. But I'm starting to think about putting these women in the context of women in Nantucket and who Johnson would have encountered and what the culture was like here. And I was looking at the newspaper, and there are lots of 
stories in the newspaper about uh, lectures on women's rights at this time and suffrage. And here's one, I don't think you can see it. I gotta figure out how to make it bigger, of the, all, the importance of women reading newspapers, same time as he's painting this. So that was a thing. Another, okay, this is fun. Let's start talking about this. So then I see this one, and I think this is at the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, and here's another strong, capable woman, you know, dominating the canvas. What's going on here? And um, so we spent some well, time. Well, this painting was acquired by the Smithsonian with the title, The Girl I Left Behind Me. Can you hear me? The Girl I Left Behind Me, okay? Well, this is the, the kind of thing that was happening in, uh, in our conversations these last few days, was like looking at these pictures and trying to kind of tease out the story in the paintings. Well, for one thing, she's really young. I mean, she looks very young. She's wearing a wedding ring, you know? So this is, there's a funny narrative going on here that we wanted to press. Well, then it turns out that that's actually not the original title of the painting. The original title was The Foggy Day. Or Maiden. The second title was Maidenhood. Young Maidenhood, right? So suddenly, and these are all titles that happen rather early on in the life of the painting. Um, so that's a lot to sort of chew on, is that people looking at this picture kept giving it new titles. But if we go back to the original title and think about this girl as Foggy Day, and then think about it being painted on Nantucket, that she's on the cliff, and that's the sea, and this is the fog of Nantucket. And like, think about her, really, that sturdy pose. I mean, she is like out there in the wind. She's strong. It, it, we suddenly began to like rethink the meaning of this painting. Okay, and the curator, um, the American art curator from SAM, Smithsonian Museum of American Art, was here, and she included this in her Civil War and American Art show, and they've always given it a kind of Civil War ring with the title. But she's like, wow, I agree. And then we went to the cliff um, right off of Nant uh, Grant Avenue, and she's like, this is where it was, she says. <laughs> and so then we're just giving it a whole new interpretive spin, which was really fun. And this is a well-known image for all of us. But to give it that and give it to Nantucket was really fun. Well, what gave it the title of We think that's the artist's first title. Where did Girl I Left Behind come from? We don't know that. It's, I mean, that's a song. And, and that, the idea okay. that, you know, it's it sort of era. latched onto the painting is that this is a soldier who's gone off to the war and left his sweetheart or his wife behind. But in fact, that's a, a, a title that was imposed on the painting by people who wanted to make it into that story. It's not necessarily what Eastman Johnson had in mind mm -hmm. when he painted it. Yeah. And, and, and I think people thought there was a battlefield below him, or people have interpreted that. Those are the fences and the uh, sand dunes and the meadows below the cliff. So we did a field trip to see if we got that far. And, and so. Oh man, we were tramping around. We were down there. <laughs> Looking out for the ticks and the poison ivy. <laughs> but we had a great trip. We really did. We had um, Neil, the... Uh, Foley. Neil, Neil Foley. Foley. Yeah. Our guy Neil yesterday. telling us, you know, what, what the vegetation was and what the, the geological landscape was all about. And um, yeah. so, so, all right. So then I thought, okay, we could do a really fun show here focusing on women in Nantucket and reinterpret them and give them more of a Nantucket context and learn some new things about them. For instance, this one. So I took this idea, I went back to Atlanta where we live half the time now and um, had lunch with the curator of American art, Stephanie Height, and I told her about this story and, and my idea for a show and she said, wow, we want to do it. Can we add Winslow Homer to it? So we started to put some images together and lo and behold, both of these artists start, were painting many of the same themes with strong, capable, thinking, smart women. And here's a good example of that. Yeah, the, the Homer is called The New Novel. And this is a picture that's so, it's a big watercolor. Um, an exhibition watercolor, and it is about a woman of leisure. In other words, she is 
got enough time that she can go out and lie on the grass and read a novel. But this is not the New Testament, folks. This is a new. This is a novel um, that you know earlier generations might have frowned on young women reading novels. So it's a picture about modernity. That is, it's a young woman who is like choosing to read a novel, um, and it's reading of her own choice. That is, as opposed to a book from school or something that her um, family has told her to read. So the sense of agency here, as well as the fact that she has the time to read, um, these are interesting stories. So this is Homer pulling this out. I have to also say, this is a very stylish young woman. This is um, a fashionable woman. And so there is an element of modernity that also the viewers of this watercolor in 1875, I think, it's about, about the date of this picture, um, would have picked up on. This is brand new. This is a modern woman. Um, this is, she looks lovely and old fashioned to us now, but we have to try and look at her again as being a very up to the minute young woman. Okay, so we and so we put some more pairs together, and I um, and we're like, wow, they're using thresholds and liminal spaces in the same ways. Uh, Johnson is on your, the left, and Homer's on the right. What's going on? And I should say that Johnson is 12 years older than Homer. And to give you some background, in 1859, he exhibited um, a work called ne Negro Life in the South. And he was plummeted to the top of what critics said, best American art, what, what, are, what do they call him? Best American genre painter, image maker out there. Winslow Homer, 12 years younger, is really ambitious, really um, keen to make a mark too, and he's watching all this and responding in his own way, as we'll see here. But how to make a show of this? And that's a, what we talked about a lot. And here's another good example of from a, the garden scene. I don't want to, I know we're getting bogged down in images. So. No, no, no. I, I, I think we keep going and get to some of the other ones. Okay, so I showed, we showed the scholars these um, images and we're like, okay, how do we make a show out of this? And here are a couple of others. That's Homer, uh, that's Johnson on the left, Homer on the right. They're borrowing costumes, poses. It's so weirdly similar. And this one, <laughs> Johnson on the left, on Nantucket, Homer on the right. And I should say that critics talked about that Homer on the right saying, God, Homer's shepherdesses are so smart and thinking, they read newspapers. I mean, they actually wrote that. So the <laughs> newspaper's a thing. <laughs> anyway, and uh, just, will you talk about this? Because you know this. This is, another, this is another example of the uh, priority of Eastman Johnson at this moment, because his painting of the old stagecoach, which is the painting on the left, of children playing in an old abandoned stagecoach was a huge hit. People were delighted by this. The, the sense of innocence of childhood, the fun the kids were having. It was a big uh, success for Johnson. And what happened to Winslow Homer is he looks at this stagecoach picture and he says, I can do that, <laughs> I can do that. And so he does Snap the Whip, which is a, a, a painting of boys playing. I don't know how many of you, we're gonna have a poll here about who of you can remember playing Snap the Whip. It's actually a kind of scary, violent game. So it's a little bit, there's always a kind of an edge in Winslow Homer. But anyway, the, la the kid at the outside is gonna get thrown out into the weeds. But, <laughs> okay, you all remember, okay. So, so it is, um, it's joyful, but it's also, there's kind edge. of an edge, edge to um, Winslow Homer. So what's fun about these comparisons is seeing the uh, differences in personality as these artists are taking on some of the same themes. The theme of childhood, a, a sense of the adventure and, and innocence and joy of childhood, but then also the danger. So that, that comparison is fun to look at. In the case of the Homer too, there is a, a, a lurking female presence here in the school teacher, because the school teacher is a big subject for Winslow Homer. So there is a kind of woman in the, lurking here in the background of the, of the Homer. 
Oh, and so these, I'm gonna let you talk about this, but I wanna introduce, for anybody who doesn't know, the painting on the left is a recent acquisition by the Nantucket Historical Association, uh, thanks to the generosity of our friends organization and numerous private donors, uh, and a great deal of um, legwork by our, our board president. We were able to acquire this at the very beginning of this year, um, and this is Cranberry Pickers. A really finished study, a work in its own right for Cranberry Pickers. It's, so it was really fun to take the scholars to show them this painting that we just bought, and everybody's like, I know this, I know this painting. Well, on the right is Philadelphia Museum of Art, Homer, the temperance painting. <laughs> the similarities are uncanny, they're there. They're looking at each other even here, and we, I had no idea. Yeah, she showed me this painting, and I just gasped. I mean, I think it's a great acquisition for the museum. So my, my first thought was, fantastic. This is just as absolutely the thing that the National the Nantucket Historical Society should own this. But then I went, oh my god, and it's really a lot like our Winslow Homer of the Temperance Meeting. Now the Temperance Meeting painting is an interesting picture because it's playing on the, the rise of the temperance movement in the United States in the 70s. That is temperance meaning um, uh, anti-alcohol, um, drinking um, milk and water and so forth. And the woman, the girl in this painting, is carrying a bucket of water. And she's offering a dipper of water to this young man. So the idea of a temperance meeting, it's a pun. And Homer really made some terrible puns in his titles. Um, but the, this one is um, a, a, an affectionate one because the idea that the woman, the girl, is sharing water with this young man as opposed to some more dangerous liquid um, and using the phrase temperance meeting, which was you know, these rallies, these kind of, um, of meetings that people would have to encourage uh, abstinence from alcohol um, and making this flirtation into uh, a story. Well, what's also so charming about the Homer is that they are not looking at each other. You know, there, there's this weird tenseness that I think we can all relate to among, it, we've all been teenagers and we've watched teenagers, and this idea that they're meeting on the path and they're kind of not looking at each other. Anyway, so the, the story of flirtation is interesting in it, and there's a lot of stories like this in Johnson as well that are about courtship and about, like, uh, oh, the, the uh, temperance meeting is 1874, but the date for the one we just bought is 1875 to 1879. You can't date them firmly. Do you have, do you have the cranberry harvest? I uh, do. In one of your slides? Yeah. Um, so the, the context. Don't get that. Hold on. Do you want to do that one first, or let me just make a quick note. So this painting, Cranberry Harvest on Nantucket from 1880, uh, one of the pinnacle of Eastman Johnson's genre painting career. That be correct to say. Um, and it's in San Diego at the Timken Museum. But this is a Nantucket scene through and through, which we will talk about in more depth in a minute. But there were more than 20 studies that the artist did testing out colors and compositions and placement of figures and numbers of figures. And many of them are, are sort of small oil studies. Um, some of them are double-sided. Well, that kind of didn't work. I'm going to flip this port over and use it again. And those, those are in various collections. And they inform a lot in terms of thinking about headed towards this picture. The one that we've just acquired is technically one of these studies. but it is very much a finished picture. It is an alternative way of looking at or addressing. It's actually signed. Yeah, it's actually signed. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it, it's him sort of resolving one particular way, this landscape at this time with this lighting, with these figures, and, and whatever meaning we want to talk about in that. So I just wanted to connect that for everybody in case that wasn't clear. Very good. I don't know, should we do um, Cranberry, our field trip now, and come back to some, the visit to the old? Talk about your research. Okay, Done. so we're gonna um, shift here for a second, and I took the scholars to where Mike and I figured out where Cranberry Harvest was painted. So these scholars, and for the rest of us, had only, so we're going to go to Nan, um, Johnson's studio and house first. So this 1873 Scribner's Monthly um, etching was or drawing was on, the only image that 
anybody as of um, in our room in the last couple of days had ever seen a Johnson studio and house on the cliff, which is about 41 cliff if you're up there. Um, but because of Mike and his partner, I was able to locate um, what photographs of his actual house. And here it is. It's a lot more grand because he added on and worked on, but he called it a little cottage. So here it is on the cliff, so much bigger from 1890. This is not a starving artist in the Garrett, folks. The <laughs> this is a very successful painter. And, and there's the Sea Cliff Inn and Johnson to the right. And I've been doing a lot of research on his wife, Elizabeth, who had a lot of money of her own and uh, from Troy, New York. And she was buying up real estate on Nantucket independently. And she was, you know, hanging out with the 400 in New York City. She was took him up the social ring, run, run, the social ladder, a couple of different rungs. So. Uh, but he always wrote about how poor he was in his letters. But nobody had seen these houses, so this is a different thing. And one of the things I want to throw in is that, you know, anybody who might have heard my talk a few weeks ago about the summer economy here on Nantucket, the development of new modern summer homes on Cliff Road and sort of north out of town, this is sort of the initial area where people who don't necessarily want to have an antique home or a historic home in town but want a summer here start building building houses, and, and one of the first successful sort of real estate schemes for, for providing plots for summer homes is on the cliff, and Eastman Johnson and his wife are right in the vanguard of buying a lot there on the cliff where the breezes are good and you're right, raised up above the boggy land below, and they build this house, and then their neighbors very soon are the Sea Cliff Inn, and they have other people you know, sort of all along there. So they're part of a really important development on Nantucket after the Civil War as the economy here is shifting. And so that's actually really important context, I think, for looking at where we're going to tell you about where the cranberry harvest was painted is it's pretty much below his house. It's right, well, yeah, pretty much below his house. Uh, it's a piece of the house. It's 41 Cliff. Yeah, check that. The studio was moved. Yes, you're right. Because Johnson and his wife bought a bunch of property by Reed Pond and over. And I think that's where he um, had the studio. And we think it's still there in a house. Yeah, and this, the, oh, we've, we've moved on, but the different Back parts up? of the original house, uh, the studio was moved further out. Uh, the sort of gambrel roofed portion that yeah. you see on the one side is now on one lot and has been expanded. And then the central portion with the gable and the entrance is. You been, can still see that gable. That, if you, yeah, and in you, a you, of it. you'd walk past and think it was a cottage from the 1920s. Right. It's been that. it's been colonialized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So let's talk about this. This is in Mike's show, and this. So what we think. Um, the cranberry harvest was painted was right down below uh, cobblestone and then below his house. And here's a picture of what it would kind of look like 1880s. Who's the name of this artist? I've completely forgotten. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. So we're standing, the artist is standing at the top of what's now called Cobblestone Hill. And so it's the path that leads sort of off the cliff, off Grant Avenue, down um, towards, I can't even think of the modern name of it, but yeah, South B Street. Um, and so you're standing there, you're looking down, you're looking towards the cliff beacons or the bug lights, uh, which had been there since the 1830s and the keeper's house for them. And then off to the right, you see the, the bathing houses for what's now jetties, then, then Cliff Beach. And you have all this, these sort of mowing lots and, and agricultural land between in the boggy areas. Yep, yep. Okay, and so one more thing. Here's another view of the house from uh, Cliff Road and that gable is still there. Let's see Cliff in. Okay, let me keep going. No, I'm not going to do that. Okay, here's um, a map from 1881, which is kind of important because I'm going to, you can see the bug lights in the far right corner. I'm going to focus in uh, on that. Here you go. That's the road coming down um, is cobble, Cobblestone Hill, the bug lights there. It's right behind um, the bug lights and close up to the cliff is where he painted the cranberry the cranberry harvest. But note all the houses up on the cliff. And also note, oh, and here's another view, but I gotta go back. Eastman Johnson painted out all of those houses in the final 
in that painting. You never see any of them. So there's a lot of artifice, artifice in here, which. Yeah, totally. You know, he obviously is constructing an image. This is not a documentary image. Right. This is an image to, to tell a story or to evoke a feeling or all of those things. And while he has included clear markers to Nantucket in terms of, we, we, we know now from, from Neil Foley that a lot of the, land, of the vegetation uh, is actual vegetation you would have found here. It's drawn, you know, to evoke the real thing. You see Brant Point Lighthouse at the very extreme left of the picture. Uh, you see a version, but a bit of an adapted version of the Congregational Church which did not have a spire at this time. And then you see the windmill. And when um, Johnson was beginning to study the idea for this painting, there were two windmills left on Nantucket. And by the time he was done and painted the final version, there was one mill, windmill left on Nantucket. Um, and the, the round top mill is sort of in line of view, like this painting shows, but you never would have been able to see it from here. And by 1876, it's gone anyway. So he's, he's moving things around in his markers of the landscape and removing out the summer homes that are all modern, which would send a completely different message than this community harvest, people coming together, and all of the other things that you can read into what these figures are doing. Right on. Anything you want to add? How are we doing on time? Because we can start talk about what we learned in the... This is good. So we go back. I'm going to go back to visit old mistress and... Con okay. Hold on. Okay, here we go. So the first day we showed the scholar all the images and a lot of ideas we had for the show. And I'm pretty partial to these pairings, but we took them apart, put them back together, and spent a lot of time going in different directions. And then this morning, I, Stephanie and I asked them to come back with very specific recommendations of how we proceed to organize the show. And again, I should tell you, the, we invited art historians to come to help make the thesis and the visual argument of the show as tight and focused as it could be, and making sure that it contributed new scholarship to the um, work that's already been done. And if it didn't, we didn't really want to do it. So we come back this morning and um, talk about a little bit about what we got a lot of great recommendations. And this uh, is one of them, where we take these pairings and maybe we select about six or five, six of these pairings of Homer and Johnson and then create a constellation of images around them and talk about all the issues that they address in different ways, making race, gender, and class a big part of these images and the story we're telling. This. This is an especially rich, you could have an entire exhibition just looking at these two paintings because they, they encapsulate the personalities of the artists and they also tell a story over time. Uh, the painting that's on the right, no, the painting that's on the left is the Eastman Johnson of Negro Life at the South. It was very quickly um, renamed, exactly like the picture of the girl on the cliff, it was renamed Old Kentucky Home. Um, and that was, again, a popular song that, you know, people wanted to make this picture be about the Old South. And so what is the backyards of Washington, D.C. suddenly became the Old Kentucky Home. This is a painting from 1859, right at the, at the lip of the Civil War, um, that is showing race relations in the backyards of Washington, D.C. And what's going on in this picture is the enslaved people of the house are kind of hanging out in the backyard, making music, little kids dancing, they're flirting, there's flirting going on um, on the left. And the mistress from the big house is coming through the door over on the right to um, visit. Maybe she's heard the music and she's coming over to listen to the banjo music or maybe she's just coming to interact with the people. But there is a very complicated story of social class and of race in this as well as the difference between the roles of men and women. So there is a ton of stuff to talk about in this painting. This made his reputation. This made him the top yeah. American art. art yeah, in 1859. In 1859. Yeah, it, it, it crowned him as one of the great figure painters in the country at the time. And I think it's because there were so many stories in it. And, of course, it's beautifully painted. I mean, Johnson could really paint well. And, I, I mean, when I, one of the things that we began this whole conversation with was, like, why Johnson and Homer? 
why would you put them together? Well, Anne's already shown you how they're working side by side, dealing with very similar themes, each with a personal inflection, maybe with a little bit of rivalry, but they're both really good, okay? So we're choosing them because they do a very good job at presenting these stories. They're, these paintings are just wonderful to look at for a long time. So that's Eastman Johnson in 1859. Fast forward to 1877, is that? Yeah, 1877 is the visit of the old mistress. Homer. It's, it's, it's the, yeah, it's the same story. White lady is coming to visit African-American women here entirely. But this is now the end of Reconstruction. This is long after the Civil War. The roles of the people have completely been overturned. That is, this white lady is walking into this room and meeting a cold wall of stairs. There's no joviality here. Uh, and so the, the tenseness between these, this, this woman arriving and the women who are looking at their old mistress, like what is, what are they thinking? What is she thinking? How have their roles changed over time? It's fundamentally the same story now 20 years on. And so how interesting to think about the changes in American culture at this time. Obviously there are important stories about women's roles, but also stories about race relations. So it's just to put these two pictures side by side, I mean, you could just spend a long time looking so at the, these. So the other thing I'm interested in, let me just end on, and maybe I'll call on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in 1876, we have the Centennial Exhibition, and Negro Life in the South got um, resurrected and feted, and there was a chromolithograph made out of it, so Eastman Johnson's success in that painting was replayed and celebrated, and I wonder if uh, Homer got a little annoyed by it, and this was his response in 1877, because it's so, it's so speaking to Negro life in the South and saying, I'm one-upping you. We don't have any, they don't talk about each other. They never mention one another. Yet Johnson sponsored Homer for the Century Club in the 1860s. They were in the same clubs. They knew each other, but there was never any mention. And one of the things that we've been, the reason we've had the scholars convening over the last few days and that we wanted to share some of our insights with, with you is, you know, in, in looking at this, we want to look at issues in American history and society in this sort of post-Civil War, pre-end of Reconstruction period um, as represented by two very fine artists. Uh, to amplify what you were saying, there are other artists who are tackling you know, the, the changing roles of women and increased independence and education. Just and not as good. They're not as good, you know. And we could open it up and do a show with, you know, tons of representative artists, but we have to draw some boundaries, and why not draw boundaries with the two people doing it the best? Um, and so we're definitely looking at, in developing this show further, you know, which pairings of paintings really get at the core of the kind of issues they're dealing with, reveal something that, that hopefully you all as audience members haven't seen before, um, contribute to scholarship where the people who are in the know haven't seen it before either, um, and, and sort of create a balance of talking about issues of race and of gender and of the importance of place in informing what they're, what they're painting. So we got into a conversation with the scholars about which pairings to introduce the show with. And we all thought this, because this is pretty dynamic and gets right to the, um, the heart of what we're getting at. Uh, but a couple of the um, historians said, well, wait up. We have um, evidence from our surveys and whatever our research that when, when visitors go through an exhibition, they breeze past the very first paintings in the show and they don't really get it. And so you have to set that up. So you lose your audience, you lose your message if we put those on the first wall that you see. And so I kind of want to leave, open it up to you all and say, do you see those first paintings? Do you know? It's an interesting question. Go ahead. Yeah, did you want to, I mean, if anybody wants and to. You can ask a question. To respond now. to that. Going back, it's for Kathy, is, is where was the Homer What's it depicting? Where is it in the South? Is it in D.C.? Homer, Homer went to Virginia. Um, and we know very little about his trip um, in 1877. Um, 
but he came back and made a couple of important paintings that of women, of young girls picking cotton, um, that are based on this Virginia experience. And so this seems to be drawing on um, his experience there. I don't think it was painted there. Homer tends to be a person who works in the studio. In fact, both Johnson and Homer, uh, the, the reality of what you're seeing in these pictures is usually very contrived. I mean, it looks natural, it looks like you were there on the spot, but especially something like Negro Life at the South with so many figures, um, it must have been painted in the studio. It wasn't actually necessarily a very particular backyard. And likewise, this, this particular, the Homer is, is so murky, and I think intentionally murky. It's a very dark picture, and the figures, uh, especially of the women, um, are in the shadow and, and um, emerging into the light. That suggests to me his fabrication of this, um, maybe based on memory or sketches, but it's not like these ladies were standing in front of him and he made them pose. Um, and so I think it's an it's a orchestrated story that he wants to tell you about the mistress meeting her former enslaved people. And that... You know, that's an imagination rather than a, a scene that he's really sketching. But they also look like they're on stage. There's a drama to it, you know, a very f artificial drama. Yeah. So I want to open it up for, for questions and sort of, you know, to summarize, you know, all exhibitions that we do, and, and we've all worked on quite a variety of exhibitions over time, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of research, it takes a lot of thought, and... It's not that you, you, you pick a bunch of pretty pictures and throw them on the wall and there you go. You really have to think through how they talk to each other, how you hang them, can you get this one on loan or not, is there another one? There's like logistical issues as well as intellectual issues. And we, we're, we're hoping we've provided at least a little bit of a window into some of that thought at an early stage. Um, we definitely are enthusiastic to do a really dynamite show uh, with some really new insights. Um, and we're still a few years out from the show actually happening, um, you know, with a catalog to write and produce and a show to design and loans to, to procure. Um, but we wanted to share at this moment that there's active stuff going on and a bit of a preview of sort of where we're headed. Um, but I'd like to open it up for, for questions um, about, about the art that you're seeing or the process that we're talking about um, or, or what have you. Yes. Well, there was a class difference, first of all. Eastman Johnson married his wife, and he went way up and um, in, in class status, and Winslow Homer did not have that. You know, you can, you can talk a little bit about that, but we have no, I mean, we know they, they exhibited in the same places. They saw, they, they were together in New York. They were in the same studio in New York in the um, 60s, but we just don't have any, you know, written evidence about other interactions other than that. I'm sorry, I would amplify and say that while we don't have them like writing to their friends saying, oh my God, I can't believe he painted that. Like we don't have that, <laughs> kind, of, that kind of evidence. The, that they are existing in the same artistic world and that world is of a certain size at this time. You know, the galleries where things are shown, um, the dealers who are bringing things from Europe that they're seeing, like they are, they are both knowledgeable and cognizant of what's going on, both with between each other and with other players in the New York art scene. And we, we can say with some confidence that there is that world that they exist in. There's, there's not one of the, it's not like Eastman Johnson is here on Nantucket and nobody ever sees him or his paintings. He's taking those paintings back to New York where people are seeing them. Yes, they were annual exhibitions at the National Academy of Design. That's exactly where uh, uh, Eastman Johnson's Negro Life at the South was shown. And I'm sure Winslow Homer in 1859 when it was first shown, um, he would have gone to see this as a kind of, at that point he was still working for Harper's Magazine, you know, he was, he was a journalist and an illustrator. Um, so you would go and study the work of your colleagues, even if you didn't know them personally, in these annual exhibitions. So that was the principal way that you would like compare notes, learn, you know, gain ideas, steal ideas, whatever. Um, then there's the point about them sharing. They each had studios in the same studio building. There were these special um, buildings in New York that were built for artists. And, and so both of them rented space in the same building. They would have bumped into each other in the corridors all the time. 
they had artist receptions in the studio buildings where they, everybody would, on a Friday night, everybody would go from studio to studio and look at each other's newest work. So apart from just the informal exchange that you might have if you were neighbors and you saw each other in a friendly fashion, there would be these public moments when the studios would all be open and work in progress would be shared. So there were ways for the artists to all kind of keep tabs on each other, even if they weren't really friends. However, the point that you made, which is that Eastman Johnson actually nominated Homer as a member of the club, the Century Club, which is a, a very exclusive club that only 100 members, it still exists today, still has only 100 members, so you had to be nominated and voted in. So that Johnson nominated Homer for this club suggests that he approved of Homer, that he thought he was a good guy, that he thought he would fit in with the Century Club. The Century Club included artists, but also mostly businessmen. And it was a great place for artists to show their work um, and meet bankers and lawyers and other collectors. So the Century Club would have artist receptions, and the artists would bring in like something new that they were working on in these little uh, monthly evenings. So that's another way where the artists could kind of rub uh, elbows with one another, but also they could meet uh, collectors. And that's another kind of subtext of this um, whole project here, is the degree to which the paintings that we're looking at, like especially the ones of pretty girls reading novels or picking flowers, are paintings that are pitched to collectors. These are not big pictures, and they wouldn't have been as expensive. Something like Negro like Life at the South, which is a fairly large picture, is, is a kind of a spectacle painting. A little picture of a girl picking a hollyhock is a picture that you would have at home, in your dining room or in your study. Um, it's, a, it's a domestic picture. So thinking about patronage and the art market, that's another sort of subtext for this exhibition as artists are struggling to make a living. Because you know, we mentioned the fact that Johnson married well and his wife had money and she herself was a real estate investor he's nonetheless consumed with making money, with earning a living, with you know, being uh, lucrative, making the job of being an artist into something lucrative. And Winslow Homer is positively obsessed with making money. He's always trying to think about the next new thing. And so that's one reason why he's such an interesting character to, to think about these new subjects of the new woman, of you know, of stylish woman, women, and of of new topics, uh, things that are fresh, because he's trying to catch uh, a collector's eye. So that's another reason why both of these guys are really good for getting the the pulse of the moment and the the attitudes of the moment. They also had the same circle of friends, which people haven't really studied, which we need to do. The, a lot of the same friends. So. Yeah, we, this is what you know. Art historians love to find is the letter from the person who knew both of them, who said, "Oh my God, I was at a dinner party last night, and Homer said this to Johnson." You know that kind of thing. We the, we have not found those I have letters. One, I have yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it, that's what you hope for. Um, and so there's always research to be done here in finding the third party who knew both of them. Yeah. I have a question about the Cape Verdean community. Many yeah. years ago, we were very privileged to see the exhibition at San Diego Museum. We were at a medical convention, and when I saw the cranberry pickers right up close and personal, I was astonished. Later on, I found out that a lot of these pickers were from the Cape Verde Islands and the, Azor and the Azorians. I thought they had initially come over as whalers. They certainly did. But I was very surprised to hear that later on, in the 1880s, they came over in droves as cranberry pickers. I'm wondering if you're going to address anything like that in your exhibition. So that's a really interesting and important Nantucket history comment. Um, there, are, there are a couple of different stages to cranberry harvesting um, on, Cape, on the Cape and in this region and on Nantucket. Uh, the kind of cranberry harvesting that's represented in the cranberry harvest is uh, 
what you might call a community harvest. It's not a intentionally planted farm of cranberries. It's a naturally occurring cranberry bog that's owned by, by one family. It's tended, it's kept going, but it, it's sort of like a found place, like you find blueberries off in the moors. And these are community members, separate community members, who come for the day to pick, and they get their share of the sales. And they've all brought their individual little baskets, and it's not standardized. And these people in this particular painting are Nantucketers, Nantucket families. Go forward 10 and 20 years, and we start seeing the development of very large, more industrialized bogs for cranberries out in the moors, so windswept and milestone cranberry bogs. And those are the ones where the Cape Verdean, um, Cape Verdean laborers come over, both to the Cape and to, to this part of Massachusetts and to Nantucket, to work there. They, they come to work in many other parts of the community as well. It's not just cranberries. but that sort of larger scale standardized industrial production is what's linked to that um, pattern of immigration. And this painting is just slightly before that. It's a, it's a different scale, it's a different place, um, it's a different sort of mode of subsistence. Um, and the full history of cranberry growing on Nantucket, which is something um, I'm certainly keen for that we get into in more depth to connect these two parts of the story is something that still needs to be done. Um, but I think that's a great question because cranberry growing here is very much linked to Cape Verdean and Azorean heritage on the island, and this particular depiction of it actually is just before that. So that's great. I have to say, though, we have been squinting at the painting and the studies because, like you, in looking at them, some of the figures look dark-skinned, and it's hard to know whether this is just a, a shadow cast by their hat or whether... He, Johnson, even whether or not there were people of color in the harvest, he is wishing to show them. Again, this is artistic license, perhaps. It's a question. We're going to be looking at those studies. Yes, Melinda. Uh, yep. when I heard, uh, uh, Anne, when I heard you speak about a year ago or so at the Yacht Club, and you were talking about the two artists and their interpretation of women, I thought that was very exciting. Now, what I've heard tonight you have, in my opinion anyway, a far greater diverse story to tell, and I hope you go with it. We're doing it. We're oh, doing it. And can you get the cranberry pickers to come? We have to keep, we have to talk about that. We're going to work on it. Well, you, you just have to. That's a, oh. We'll <laughs> tell them that you said so. We, no, it, I mean, the next, really Mike introduced this, the, the next stage, after you kind of get the bones of the ideas and, and your ideal um, checklist, then you have to go out in the world and convince people to lend you those pictures. And at the moment, Anne's checklist um, has like 120 things on it. Probably the show will be smaller than that. Um, but what you do is you kind of make your ideal list. And you're not going to get like a... You go after the paintings that you really, really need. Um, and then if for some reason the people are, you know, they promised it to another project or the painting is too fragile to travel, I mean, there's so many reasons why um, people will not allow their picture to join a, a, a traveling exhibition, then you go to your second choice. So this is like the second phase of planning is to try and um, sweet talk or strong arm or barter, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, in other words, the museums have, uh, sometimes you offer an exchange painting, you say, you've lend us your cranberry pickers and we'll lend you something, it's that, you know, there are all different ways that these negotiations go on. You offer to help with the conservation of the piece in order to make it, if they're worried about its condition, say, well, you can help with that. There's a hundred of little strategies here. Right, and if... But, it, but it, in Anne's first talk, these two pictures no. were, not, were not part of your talk. Right. And so tonight I've heard things that make the show, in my opinion, far more interesting and meaningful. So these stories have to be told and several other that you've brought up, but you don't have paintings to show. Yeah. That, that's exactly the goal. It's, and the, the whole process has been to refine and improve, see what we're leaving out that like we, we shouldn't leave out. Um, and if you go and try and get your loans before you've done this thought process, they're going to see right through you and they're going to say no. You just want our pretty picture, but you haven't told us why it's really vital that cranberry harvest come here. We are now much closer to the point where we can say to the Timken in San Diego, we hope, this is why this is crucial 
to this new story about these two artists and why it's important to show it in this place where it was created. Is there anybody in the room who has any clout at the San Diego Museum, the Timken? Timken, okay. the Timken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did either of these uh, artists use dealers? And if so, did they use the same dealer at any time? That's I don't, I don't think I can answer that. Yes, they did. Yes, they use dealers. I don't know if they use the same dealers. That's a great question. We'll get back to you. Yeah, we'll look into that. Was I was just going to say Homer's interaction with dealers is mostly on the later part of his career after um, the 1880s. And so in this moment, and the focus in this, the works that we've been looking at is really the 60s and the 70s. He's not, I don't think he has a dealer. Um, and, but I just don't know the answer yeah, for Eastman yeah, Johnson. It, it is an interesting moment in American art history because the dealer system is just being born. Yes, yes, but it, it, the, the, uh, the uh, sophistication and the uh, proliferation of the dealer is a thing that's happening at this very moment, I think worldwide. Paris and London are ahead of this curve here. American dealers are just starting to establish themselves in the 1870s. Yeah. Was there one question in here that we didn't get to? Yeah. Well, actually, there are paintings of of the couples, you know, individual paintings called Southern Courtship is one of, of each of the some of the couples in there that we want to bring in and highlight and compare to Winslow Homer, who had couples similarly. Yes, so we in, so we envision thanks to these scholars my the apparent the idea of the pairings, but then we have a constellation of other images that un, help us unpack these these, the messages in these stories. And it's, I'm focusing on race and class and gender in ways, yeah, and you know, all of that. I mean, it's also interesting to think about the way the pictures are put together and then mind to make separate pictures out of the figures, which is what's happened to the, the new painting that you just got. Because the two figures that are in that painting actually don't appear in the, the final big painting. Oh, uh, you know, he's experimenting with different poses, with different groupings, um, and so like versions of them appear in the big Timken painting, but not exactly this pair. So it's kind of become a separate spin-off. And for Homer in the Temperance meeting, there is a single painting of just the girl with the pail. Oh, maybe I you know. Have in that. other words, that became. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, and and so he he put her together with the boy um, in another painting. And so it's an insight into the kind of construction of the pictures themselves and how artists take the same figure and maybe move it around into different paintings. One of the, one of the larger questions I asked the scholars this week uh, was, what kind of agency do the women have in these paintings we're looking at? Are they just decorative? When do they, when are they smart? feel smart, when are they not? And there's a range, and here, this is a pretty girl on the left, and he transforms her into a pretty beefy, strong <laughs> woman in her own right. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, I think we are at the end of our time here. Um, are there any concluding comments that either of you would like to make? I know one comment I wanna make, and that is that everybody is invited to step into the Williams Forsyth Gallery when we're done here, and take a look at Cranberry Pickers, the new, the new painting that we've acquired. Uh, it is displayed with three other paintings um, by Elizabeth Rebecca Johnson. That's a Johnson, why am I saying that? Elizabeth <laughs> Rebecca Coffin, um, that we've recently acquired, as well as a very important painting that's on loan from the Rhode Island Historical Society of young Isabella Draper from 1851. So I do invite everybody on your way. Don't bolt for the doors, but take a look there um, in the gallery. And if we don't have any other comments, I would say thank you all very much for coming.